Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Katja Achermann, and I am a member of the Executive Committee of the Cambridge Pro Bono Project, or CPP. And on behalf of the Cambridge Pro Bono Project, I would like to welcome you all to the CPP Speaker Series talk tonight. By way of brief background, the CPP is now in its 11th year. It is a research program run out of the Faculty of Law at the University of Cambridge. What we do is to partner faculty members and graduate research students with leading barristers chambers, charities and NGOs to produce targeted research on issues of contemporary social significance. Alongside that work, we also provide a network here in Cambridge for students and faculty members with an interest in pro bono work and human rights. To that end, we are launching a regular speaker series this year. And as one of our speakers this term, I would like to very warmly welcome Professor Saul Lehrfreund, who will speak on the death penalty, context, challenges and controversy. Professor Lehrfreund has dedicated his career to representing prisoners facing the death penalty in criminal and constitutional proceedings, as well as well as before international bodies and courts. He is the co-founder and co-executive director of the Death Penalty Project, an international legal action charity based at Simmons, Muirhead and Burton LLP in London. For more than three decades, the Death Penalty Project has provided free legal representation to those facing the death penalty. It uses the law to protect prisoners facing execution and achieve fairer and more humane justice systems. Since joining Simon Muirhead and Burton in 1992, Professor Lehrfreud has assisted lawyers in countries across the globe, including Uganda, Nigeria, India, Malaysia, Belize, or Trinidad and Tobago in death penalty cases. He also participated in expert delegations to Japan, Taiwan, China and India, focusing on criminal justice reforms and the potential for restriction and abolition of the death penalty. He is, moreover, a founding member of the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office Pro Bono Panel, which represents British nationals facing the death penalty. As a leading authority on capital punishment and international human rights law, Professor Lehrfreund has published and lectured extensively on these topics. In recognition for his services to international human rights law, he was awarded an MBE in 2000 and also received an honorary degree of doctors, Doctor of Laws from the University of Reading where in 2016, he was also appointed visiting professor of law. Professor Lefroy's work has saved the lives of thousands of prisoners and fundamentally transformed the legal landscape in the countries in which he and the Death Penalty Project operate. We are therefore extremely grateful to Professor Lefroy to have him um, here to talk to us about the death penalty and to virtually host him here at Cambridge. Professor Lehrfreund will be speaking for about 30 to 40 minutes and his talk will be followed by a 15 to 20 minute Q&A se session. Please do post any questions you may have for Professor Lehrfreund um, in the Q&A section of Zoom rather than in the chat function so people can see what you're asking. I would now like to hand over to Professor Lehrfreund. Um, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Katja. Um, thank you very much for that very, um, very kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm still not used to speaking, looking at myself, um, so I'll do my best. Um, it's much better when we can actually be in the same space. So hopefully um, in months to come, um, I'll come and visit you in Cambridge and uh, we can do it all over again um, and during happier times. Um, so I'm going to try to get some slides up. So you have to bear with me. Technolo technology. Oh, here we go. OK. Right. Oops. 
just one sec. Okay, so um, so I'm going to talk about the death penalty. I'm going to do a sort of global tour of the death penalty as quick as I can, um, and to take you through um, a sort of global context: what's going on in the world, um, who still has the death penalty, are we winning the battle, um, what are the challenges that remain, and and to talk about some controversies as well. But I'll just start off by um, a few of my own thoughts really about capital punishment. Um, I've been doing this for a few decades now, so I've got um, quite, a, quite, quite a few views um, that I'll share with you. Um, but I think I'll start off that the idea um, of putting people to death in the 21st century is simply barbarism. And if we lose one person who's innocent to execution, it's a condemnation of our society as a whole. And where such risks exist, and believe me, they do exist, um, there's simply no room for capital punishment, regardless of cultural expectations of citizens and the demands of public opinion. So I don't need to moralize about the death penalty, whether I believe in it, whether I don't believe in it, well, I clearly don't believe in it, because I believe it's barbaric. Um, but you don't even have to take that view. Um, we can talk about pragmatic reasons why there should be no space for the death penalty based on a proper understanding of criminal justice systems. And once the fallibility of any criminal justice system is recognized, and as lawyers, um, we should recognize that criminal justice systems are human and mistakes are inevitable. Um, the question is, is not, um, does the person deserve to die? Um, but the question is really, do we the people deserve to kill? So I'm going to, I hope this works, but I've embedded a few videos and I'll try and play a few videos to break it up a bit. Um, and this video is focusing on Taiwan where we've been working for a long time um, with some fantastic partners at the Taiwan Alliance to win the death penalty. And there are currently 40 prisoners on death row in Taiwan. Um, I hope this video will play for some reason. It doesn't want to play. Let's try another way. Sorry, bear with me. Sujan 自己明知道自己是冤枉被关了五千三百二十二天我都必须坚强的去面对
，所以你只能等待，每天都都等待，你一天一天一天的等，最难过的就是在等待的时候，你你那种心情，你一边会很期待他们赶快来带你去自己，赶快解脱，因为死对我们来讲，当下是一种解脱。其实一开始回来那段时间，其实不太敢出门，一来是怕人群，二来是不喜欢出去被吃吃减减的那种感觉。大概有一年多的时间才才比较能适应我们社会正常的生活。Okay, so um, Catch has already very helpfully um, described the work of the Death Penalty Project, so I don't need to repeat that. But I just say, based on what we've just seen, that innocence and miscarriages of justice, as well as the understanding that the death penalty is the province of the poor, the marginalised and the vulnerable, really lies at the heart of our work and has done for more than 30 years. And we provide our main work, maybe 60%, 70% of our work is to provide free legal representation to individuals in criminal appeals um, to support NGOs and lawyers around the world who are representing prisoners facing potential execution. Um, so that really is concerned with um, to decide or to help a court to decide whether um, conviction is safe, whether there's been a miscarriage of justice. But we're also involved in strategic litigation, which is looking at systemic change. So just to give you a few examples, um, we brought a case way back in 1993 called Pratt and Morgan, and this challenged the death row phenomenon. This was a Jamaican case, and the two prisoners had been on death row for 14 and a half years. And we challenged the idea that um, prisoners should be kept on death row for that period of time, um, based on understanding that after a certain period of time, it would just amount to cruel and unusual treatment and punishment. Um, and in Taiwan, clearly, you can see that those individuals were kept for decades on death row. Um, we've also challenged the mandatory death penalty now successfully in 13 countries. Um, this is where the judge has no discretion. Um, and the result of those cases has been huge. So in Uganda, for example, where we successfully challenged the mandatory death penalty, um, in one case, it resulted in all 900 prisoners having their death sentences quashed and all being entitled to be resentenced. And none of the prisoners that were resentenced ended up back on death row. Um, we've also been involved in strategic, strategic cases challenging the clemency process um, and to try to open up the clemency process to judicial review. But aside from the legal representation, we, we try to take a holistic approach um, legal interventions on their own um, are great, they save lives, they restrict the law, but to create real change, um, you need to be involved in other um, activities. So we focus heavily on education, um, awareness raising, research, and also ultimately advocacy um, with policymakers who are going to make the change. So that's about legal representation. Um, we don't work in um, the United States. Um, we work predominantly in the Commonwealth, but a few other non-Commonwealth countries like Taiwan and Japan as well. Um, our work started exclusively in taking appeals to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. I won't get into who the Privy Council is, but the Privy Council used to be the, the um, final court of appeal for all of the British Empire. So at one stage, this tribunal that sits in London and is made up of our Supreme Court judges 
had jurisdiction over two thirds of the world. Imagine that, um, but it did. Um, but even today, the Privy Council still has a jurisdiction um, for a number of Commonwealth Caribbean countries. And we act in nearly all death penalty appeals from the Caribbean and bring criminal and constitutional appeals up to the Privy Council um, from local courts in the Caribbean. Um, that work evolved to taking cases to international human rights tribunals. We've litigated very heavily before the UN Human Rights Committee um, under the ICCPR. And we were also very present before the Inter-American Human Rights System, both the Inter-American Commission and the court. And our constitutional litigation, which started in the Privy Council, has really now spread throughout the Commonwealth. I mentioned Uganda, um, we've taken cases to Malawi, um, but what's been so interesting jurisprudentially is that some of the judgments have really gone viral. Um, so you see judgments from the Privy Council on um, death penalty issues um, being cited all around the world um, and making a real mark, um, in particular some recent judgments from the late Lord Bingham. Um, so these judicial reforms have been critical. Um, and what they've done is they've created non-executing states. So they seriously restricted um, both the imposition and use of the death penalty, but they haven't achieved abolition. And I'll come on to that. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, abolition is a political question. So restricting the death penalty in law saves lives. Um, but in the vast majority of abolitionist countries, um, the death penalty has been ended through the political process, not through the judicial process. Um, and ultimately, abolition requires principled leadership, leadership. So for us, interactions with policymakers is crucial to encourage a re-examination of outdated laws, procedures and policies um, within the criminal justice system. The death penalty is a criminal justice issue, ultimately, as well as obviously a human rights issue. So our work outside of litigation focuses on raising standards, uh, better understanding of human rights issues at stake, um, targeted training to judges, to mental health professionals. Mental disorder is a huge issue that we focus on within the death penalty. Um, but um, whilst the standards are very clear in law um, that you shouldn't be sentencing somebody to death who is mentally disordered, um, the real issue for the implementation of that standard is practical. And if you don't have mental health professionals conducting assessments of prisoners facing um, potential death sentences, um, then that standard will never be realized because lay people simply can't um, diagnose um, mental disorder or intellectual disability. Um, so we do a lot of work with mental health professionals around the world. Um, and we try to create national advocates for change. I mean, one of the things that we're conscious of being a UK based NGO is that we're not going to change the death penalty. It has to be in country um, if the death penalty is going to move. Um, one of our principles that we've always had is we don't work anywhere without an invitation. So we don't parachute into any country and say we know better. Um, we, we work with local NGOs with partner organisations, and we strengthen um, civil society wherever we work, we try to at least, um, and we try to give them the tools to create an environment for change. And part of that work has been to commission empirical research, and I'll come on to the research, which has become increasingly important. Um, it allows um, policymakers, the general public, to make a much more informed appraisal of the issues at stake. Um, that is what the research has done and to create a new dialogue around the death penalty. And I'll, I'll focus in a bit on some of the research. But before I do that, let's just have a little look at what's going on in the world. So um, just a few headlines. Um, it, it depends how you count. I mean, counting around the death penalty is quite interesting and mapping. But um, just to take the amnesty figures to start off with, um, we've now reached a stage where 72% of the world's nations have abolished in law and practice. Abolition in pra abolitionist in practice are countries, um, the definition is there, it's from amnesty, countries who have gone for more than 10 years without an execution, but also have a settled policy, a moratorium in place, for example, they're categorized as abolitionist in practice states. Um, 
Now, whilst 84 countries or 85 countries retain, the United Nations has categorized 49 of those states as de facto abolitionist states. This was at the end of 2018. Um, so in total, the UN has recorded 164 member states as abolitionist or abolitionist de facto. So the definition of de facto abolitionist is a country who was not executed for 10 years. So that's 83% of all the UN member states are regarded as either abolitionist or abolitionist de facto. And um, this has been a very quickly moving picture. Um, over the last 30 years, we've witnessed an explosion of abolition around the world. So when I started um, many years ago, back in 1992, people like me fighting against the death penalty, we were very much in the minority and the majority of the world at that stage retained the death penalty. And since then, you know, we've, we've, we've changed sides. We're now winning, right? We're in the, we're in the, my, my, we're in the majority and the retentionists are very much in a shrinking minority. And just to give you some idea of this, this change, um, 1948, only 15 countries around the world had abolished the death penalty. There were eight for all crimes and seven for ordinary crimes. If you move forwards to 1988, there were 52 abolitionists in law. Um, there were 35 for all crimes, seven for, 17 for ordinary. So only 28% of the world um, had abolished the death penalty um, in law. Um, there were a further 27 who were regarded as abolitionist in practice. So at that stage in 1988, not so long ago, only 38% were abolitionist in law or practice. Whereas now there are 72% under those particular definitions. Um, if you look regionally in Africa, in 1981, there was only one abolitionist country. Today, there are 22 countries within the African Union who have abolished. So 80% now of the countries within the African Union um, have abolished in law or practice. So I'm just trying to sort of show that the change has been rapid um, in terms of countries moving away from the death penalty. Um, just a few words on the US. I mean, we're not a US based organization, but it would be remiss of me not to mention the US when talking about the death penalty. Um, you need to break down the US. Um, New Hampshire became the 21st state to abolish a death penalty in 2019. And then shortly after Colorado became the 22nd state to abolish the death penalty. 28 states retain, but only five states in the US carried out executions um, so far this year in 2020. Um, and even more interestingly, of the 15 executions that have been carried out in the United States this year, eight of them have been federal executions carried out by the Trump administration. Um, really shocking stuff. Um, in 2019, there were 22 executions carried out by seven states and no federal executions. So just a few words about federal executions. As I say, it would be remiss not to mention this. This year were the, was the, fir the first federal executions for 17 years. Um, eight have been carried out so far in the last five months, um, with a further five scheduled um, before um, during the transitional period. Um, and the seven that were carried out um, in the four months leading up to the presidential ele election were the most federal executions carried out in the last 78 years. Um, Orlando Hall became the eighth federal person to be executed by the Trump administration on the 11th of November. And the last time that a US government carried out an execution between an election and the inauguration of a new president was 132 years ago. So that just gives you some context to what is actually going on um, in America at the moment as we speak. Um, so while states have been conducting the fewest executions over the last 37 years, um, the federal government has broken all records that have existed since 1896. Um, so that's just a little, um, just a bit of contemporary information on what is going on um, in the US. Um, the, the, this slide um, just talks about a vote that happens at the UN General Assembly biannually every two years, 
um, and there's a vote, um, all UN member states vote on a resolution calling for a worldwide moratorium. And you can see there this reflection of global change is evidenced in um, the moratorium vote. Um, every couple of years, the vote increases, those in favor um, goes up, those against goes down. Um, so the trend is evidenced in, in many different ways. Um, okay, this is the horrible league table. These are the um, big executing countries around the world. Um, the pluses is where we're not sure. Okay, so the pluses mean we don't have the exact data. This again comes from Amnesty. So in, in 2019, if you exclude China, um, because we don't have exact figures from China, Amnesty recorded uh, 657 executions um, in 20 countries. That is the lowest number for a decade. And excluding China, 86% 86, 86 of executions took place in just four countries, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Egypt. Um, but I mean, what's interesting is, um, I don't like using the word only or just, but 20 countries executed out of a total of 193 UN member states. So there are not that many executing countries and there are even less persistent executors. Um, so just seven countries we can count who have carried out more than 10 executions annually um, for more than a decade. Um, just touching on China, China is by far the world's biggest executor. Um, but there's no verifiable data. Um, executions are classified as a state secret. But anecdotally, we know that numbers are going down. So the estimates in 1988, I think, were around 24,000 executions a year. Um, now the numbers are much less. We don't know exactly, but um, in the low thousands, but nowhere near 24,000. So even in China, um, the death penalty is somewhat shrinking. Um, seeing as we are in the UK, um, just a few words on um, abolition in the United Kingdom. Um, in 2015, that marked 50 years since we effectively abolished the death penalty for the offence of murder. Um, a little bit of history, by the 1950s, um, public appetite, um, not public opinion, but public appetite for the death penalty started to fade. And this was really centered around three notorious miscarriages of justice that most of them, I think they've all become films or they've all, there are definitely films, uh, movies about all these cases. Um, the first one was the terrible miscarriage of justice and execution of Timothy Evans in 1950. Um, there's a film called Rillington Place about um, that particular case. Three years after he was executed, um, it was discovered that the murders were in fact um, it was a wife and his child um, were committed by John Christie and not by Timothy Evans, who was wrongly executed. In 1952, Derek Bentley was executed. Um, it was a very famous film called Let Him Have It. Um, a young guy called Craig actually fired the fatal shots of the policeman. Um, Bentley was um, standing by. Craig was a juvenile, so he wasn't executed. Um, Bentley was executed. He was um, notoriously um, said to have mentioned the words, let him have it. Um, and there was a debate about whether it was let him have it, i.e. shoot him or let him have the gun. Um, but anyway, thousands of people signed a petition of mercy, um, asking the Home Secretary not to carry out the execution. That was ignored. And his family then spent 40 years clearing his name until he was um, granted a posthumous pardon. Um, the other case that caused a lot of public concern was Ruth Ellis, um, the last woman to be executed, um, convicted of shooting her boyfriend. Again, thousands of people signed a petition for her mercy, a reprieve, but again, that was denied. And these cases really spurred the movement and created momentum for Parliament to push for abolition in the UK. Um, these ca cases raised concerns about innocence, um, mentally disabled people facing the death penalty um, and the vulnerable being executed. And there was also a growing recognition, at least within the judiciary, parliamentarians and the media, 
um, that the death penalty was inextricably linked to error, arbitrariness, discrimination, and inevitable cruelty. Um, and what's interesting about the UK experience, and there's a very um, good report um, written by um, Julia Knowles. So Julia Knowles, now a High Court judge, who wrote this um, very interesting um, report for us, um, which is published, it's available on our website, and it tells the whole story. Is there many lessons that other countries can learn from our experience of having the death penalty and abolishing the death penalty? And I think there are many lessons that can be learned from many countries who have moved away from the death penalty. Um, one, I mean, miscarriage of justice is the obvious one. And post abolition, we again had a, a stack of miscarriage of justice cases. Um, and had we had the death penalty, um, innocent people would have been executed in this country. Um, the Guildford Four, the Birmingham Six, Stephen Kisco, um, all terrible cases, but all innocence cases and miscarriage of justice cases. But the other, um, the other lesson concerns public opinion. And what we know from our experience is that post abolition, you see that popular attitude shift with the so the politicians take the lead and then the public do follow the political lead and opinion polls have shown decreasing support for capital punishment since we abolish in 1986 it was 74 percent 2007 down to 50 percent in 2014 we went down to 45 percent so um abolition does create change in terms of public attitudes people it's no longer the normative expectation once it's no longer on the statute books so another measurement an interesting measurement of capital punishment is to look at the pace of change in the commonwealth where we work extensively as compared to the globe and when you isolate the commonwealth interestingly you see the pace of change is different and slower there are 41 retentionist countries within the Commonwealth compared to 27% globally, and only 35% of the Commonwealth have abolished compared to 54% globally. Um, there is a, a strong conversation to be had about the colonial legacy of the death penalty. Um, we abolished it in 1965 in the UK, yet it was bequeathed throughout the Commonwealth during colonial times. Um, pretty much used as a repressive tool, um, yet it seems very, very hard to shift um, post um, since countries have become independent within the Commonwealth. It's a very interesting conversation. It is not just linked to the death penalty. Um, some of the worst aspects of colonial laws, and the death penalty being one of them, sodomy laws, criminalization of homosexuality, remain on the statute books in many Commonwealth countries today. Um, and whilst, you know, we would always say it's very important to recognize the historical context, um, countries should address the past and reject outdated and cruel punishments and create modern criminal justice systems fit for purpose. Um, there's no room to rely on the past to defend the present, um, one could say. Um, again, not enough time just to focus on um, that is another conversation to be had. Um, okay, so barriers to abolition. Um, wherever we work, um, countries claim the death penalty is often unique to their culture and history, but the barriers to change always seem to be the same. Um, whichever continent we confront the death penalty, and it's a combination, there are more factors but essentially it's a combination of these factors um, that are relied on to justify retention or um, an inability to move towards abolition. So ultimately abolition being a political question, one needs to confront these perceived um, obstacles to change. And I'm just gonna focus on public opinion. Um, there's no time to really deal with the other Areas. I mean, deterrence is a, a poor argument for retention. I mean, social science has debunked um, the whole concept that there's any greater deterrent effect. There's no evidence to support the assertion that the death penalty provides a greater deterrent effect than other forms of serious punishment, i.e. long-term imprisonment. Um, 
So I think social science is not a serious conversation anymore around deterrence. Likewise, national sovereignty, I don't think that there's a serious conversation to be had. Treaties regulate state behavior in so many ways um, that to say that the death penalty is so solely a matter of national criminal justice policy um, doesn't hold true anymore. But our, I mean, when, when one talks about public opinion, um, maybe I'll, I'll frame it in a couple of questions. Um, is the death penalty a political ne necessity because it's demanded by a large majority of the public? Or would the government and a criminal justice system lose legitimacy if politicians were to ignore public sentiment? And those are the questions that are often framed in retentionist countries around um, popular sentiment and the death penalty. Um, just a few initial pointers around this whole conversation of public opinion and the death penalty in human rights. Um, we accept that public opinion can't be entirely ignored, um, but ultimately a country that's concerned for human rights shouldn't really accept public opinion as a reason for retaining the death penalty. And I say that especially when public opinion is more often than not based on misconceptions about the assumed deterrent effect and the fairness and safety in the death penalty's application. And research has also shown um, that the majority who support the death penalty in retentionist countries do so because they are socialized and conditioned to accept it as the cultural and legal norm, rather than a sound basis of knowledge and principle. And what's very interesting is that we can't think of a country that have abolished the death penalty because the public have demanded or even supported abolition. It's always been a question of principal leadership and political will. It's never been abolished because of public sentiment. Um, and we don't believe that public sentiment alone should determine penal policy. Now, before I talk about the, this slide about public opinion in Malaysia, I just wanna to touch on a very sad subject and our work for more than two decades has um, was greatly assisted um, by Professor Roger Hood and tragically Roger passed away just two weeks ago and Roger was a tireless, tireless champion um, of justice um, and human rights and he was a dear friend to all of us at the Death Penalty Project and I'd like to pay tribute to Roger now. Um, He'd only just completed a very new piece of research for us. He was 84. Um, he was working tirelessly right up to um, the end. And he just completed a study on, um, on opinion leaders' um, attitudes to the death penalty in the Caribbean. And his contribution, not only to our work, but to the abolitionist movement globally was absolutely immense. Um, he spent two decades designing and conducting unique and original research to challenge assumptions around the death penalty, especially around this question of public opinion, and to provide us and others um, in the community, NGO community and governments um, and IGOs um, with new empirical data to assist our efforts to bring about change. Um, and I'd like to shed light on this Malaysia study um, this brilliant um, piece of work that Roger masterminded um, in Malaysia a few years ago. And it has, um, it's a groundbreaking piece of research. And it was really focused around the mandatory death penalty, which Malaysia still retains. Um, but we were confronted um, by statements from parliamentarians that the public, public strongly supported the use of the mandatory death penalty and that public sentiment would be a barrier to any reform. Um, but there was no empirical data to back up those assertions. So against that background, we commissioned Roger to, um, it says Roger Hood and the DPP, we didn't, we commissioned Roger to conduct the first large scale um, study on the mandatory death penalty in Malaysia um, using Ipsos, an independent research agency it was a huge study with over 1,600 respondents. Um, it raised a large number of questions, but also Roger devised a number of scenario cases and the public were asked to judge those cases and sentence 
those cases um, based on the facts presented. And when faced with real case scenarios, very, very few people were actually sentenced to death. Um, so the report's available on our website, but um, I'll just touch on a few of the um, findings. Um, and the, these types of surveys have challenged assumptions made by governments that it's necessary to, to retain the death penalty because public opinion reflects high level of interest and concern. But when we did this survey, um, the results showed a very low lack of interest, concern and knowledge. So fewer than one in 10 were concerned about the death penalty. That's less than 10%. Um, over 50% said they weren't informed at all. And actually 59% didn't even know that the death penalty was mandatory from this representative sample. Um, so these findings were particularly interesting. Um, there were other very important questions about the impact of information on the public. And support is contingent on the belief that the death penalty is administered without error. And when you introduce to the public questions about would they still support the death penalty if they knew that an innocent person could be executed, um, support fell dramatically. Um, not only in Malaysia, but in parallel surveys we've worked on in China, um, public support dropped from 58% to 25%. In Trinidad, support dropped from 90% to 30%. And in Singapore, it dropped from 90% to 40%. Um, the other very interesting question that I pulled up is one about um, policy. Is the death penalty the most appropriate policy? So whilst as a headline figure, um, a majority would support the death penalty, those same majority, that same majority did not feel that the death penalty was the most effective policy when asked to rank a number of policies um, as the most effective in reducing violent crime. And this draws on the findings from a parallel survey in Singapore. Um, in all the surveys we've conducted where we've posed this ranking question, social action and police effectiveness are always regarded by the public to be the most effective policies. And very interestingly, more execution is always ranked last. Wherever we've done in, included this type of ranking question. So whilst the public say they support the death penalty, they don't actually believe it's an effective tool to combat um, violent crime. So I'm going to go to a short film. I'll have to get out of this um, to show it. Um, just a short film about this survey. The practice of automatically imposing the death penalty, a relic of colonialism, has been widely rejected as having no place in the modern world. A majority of countries have abolished the mandatory death penalty, and of the 53 nation commonwealth, just nine still impose this outdated law. And six of these have not carried out executions for at least two decades. That leaves just three. In Malaysia, the death penalty is mandatory for murder, treason, and certain cases of drug trafficking and firearms offenses. The individual circumstances of the case cannot be taken into account. The judge has no option but to impose a death sentence. An independent academic survey revealed that 53% of Malaysians were not informed about the death penalty. Most people did not even know that the death penalty was automatic for certain crimes. The same survey revealed a majority of Malaysians did not think the death penalty was appropriate in many case scenarios, deemed typical by the Attorney General's office. Case 1, 19-year-old male, previous convictions, none, crime, shoots dead a drug dealer on orders of an older man. Case 2, female, previous convictions, none, crime, kills her abusive husband by deliberately poisoning his food. Case 3, 19-year-old male, previous convictions, none, crime, broke into house at night carrying a loaded gun, shoots at householder when disturbed but misses, no one is killed. Just one in a hundred people thought the death penalty should be imposed in all the cases they were asked to consider. 
The mandatory death penalty is one of the reasons Malaysia's death row population is so large. At the end of 2017, it was reported there were more than 1,000 people under sentence of death in Malaysia. In Vietnam, 600. Thailand, 502. India, 371. Indonesia, 260. Japan, 134. And Singapore, around 40. Now Malaysia's newly elected government has promised to abolish oppressive laws, including the mandatory sentence of death by hanging, a penalty widely rejected across the world as an abhorrent practice that is unjust and inhumane. With the government, the international community, and the Malaysian public all opposing the mandatory death penalty, is it time to consign this colonial relic to history? Read the independent public opinion survey and other research at deathpenaltyproject.org. Okay, so j just to end up, just I started on wrongful convictions and I, I think I'll end up on wrongful convictions as well. Um, it's so powerful. Um, we know that there is no such thing as a perfect justice system. Um, we know that error, arbitrariness, discrimination against minorities and the most vulnerable members of society is part and parcel of the death penalty problem. Um, I've mentioned the problem in the UK of certain cases. You saw um, the video from Taiwan. But just focusing on the US, since 1973, 172 people have been released from death row with evidence of their innocence. And many of those 172 prisoners spent decades proving their innocence. Um, the question that remains is how many people have been executed um, who were unable to uncover evidence or were unable to get good lawyers to prove their innocence. Um, so I'll just end up by taking you through a few slides um, about the case of Anthony Ray Hinton. So he was arrested in 1985. He was charged with two murders and he was sentenced to death. Um, he was eventually released some 30 years later in 2015. He was the 100 and well, so far 172 people have been exonerated. Um, this point at the bottom, this comes from something that Brian Stevenson, who's one of our patrons, people may know who Brian is. Um, he runs EJI in Alabama. Um, the film Just Mercy is about Brian. Um, but Brian always says that for every nine people executed in the US in the modern era, one person on death row has been exonerated. Um, and what Brian says is, would you get on a plane if one in nine flights crashed? Um, and it's quite a powerful thought, really. Um, so this is just a, a short film now um, about Anthony Ray Hinton. You never think about your freedom until it's taken away from you. Wherever capital punishment exists, there is the risk that innocent people will be sentenced to death. In the US alone, 163 people have been freed from death row since 1973. Eight of those people, released in just the last five years, had spent at least 30 years each on death row. In 1985, Anthony Ray Hinton was arrested and charged with two murders he did not commit. I was cutting grass. I just happened to look up and there's two white gentlemen standing there and I, I said, can I help you? And they identified themselves as detectives. And they said, we have a warrant for your arrest. And I said, for what? They said, we're charging you with first degree attempted murder, first degree robbery, and first degree kidnap. I said, well, you got the wrong person. I ain't done none of that. 
The state wrongly claimed that bullets from the crimes came from a gun found in his mother's house. There was no other evidence against him. What would you do if you passed a polygraph test but no one believed you? What would you do if you didn't have enough money to pay for a good lawyer? So his ballistics expert was blind? In one eye, yes, that's correct. In 1989, the Equal Justice Initiative took on Anthony Ray Hinton's case. They engaged three of the nation's top firearms experts. And all three of them came to the same conclusion that the bullets didn't match. After a long legal battle, the US Supreme Court overturned Anthony Ray Hinton's conviction in 2014. After 30 years, he was finally set free. They took my 30s, my 40, my 50, but what they couldn't take was my joy. No criminal justice system is perfect. Mistakes happen wherever you are in the world. All it takes is one dishonest police officer, one incompetent lawyer, one overzealous prosecutor or one mistaken witness and the system fails. In 2016, more than 60 death row prisoners were exonerated worldwide. But these are just the cases we know about. <laughs> Many wrongful convictions will never be discovered. Knowing all this, how can the death penalty ever be justified? Okay, I've got to get out of this. Uh, I think okay. if you if you stop sharing your screen, um, at the yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So thank you, everybody. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, that's a good point to stop. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for, for your presentation. Um, that was really, really interesting. Um, now we're going to um, just, any, any, if the audience has any questions, please type them in the Q&A. Um, we do have some questions that we were sent beforehand. So, um, Katja, do you want to kick off? Yes, thank you um, very much, Saul, um, for your very interesting talk. Um, Matt Saikaris, a fellow PhD student at the law faculty and also a member of the um, Cambridge Pro Bono Project, asks, um, has the recent global trend towards more authoritarian government changed or affected your advocacy for reform and the nature of your work with governments and law reform bodies? Has there been a noticeable change in culture in recent years? Uh, you just need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are, I mean, I mean, it's a really good question. I mean, I think that our, our focus is you have to pick your your countries. So I would say that there are a number of countries who are in the de facto abolitionist group. Um, some countries have um, have the death penalty on the statute books, haven't carried out executions for decades. Um, Kenya, nearly 40 years. Um, some of the Caribbean countries for 30 plus years. Those countries, we feel there's a conversation to be had about finally abolishing the death penalty. Um, there are other countries where the conversation is much harder um, and abolition isn't potentially realistic um, at the moment. Um, so in those countries, it's about um, trying to restrict the death penalty, um, trying to push for moratoriums on the death penalty, um, but yeah, where countries are authoritarian, where countries don't respect the rule of law, um, the conversation is very difficult to, to have. But I, I do feel that even for those regimes, you can see with the numbers that the um, persistent executors are being isolated um, and there's a small group of them that are left and it's not really a, a good group. And I think reputation does matter not everywhere, but in a lot of countries. And um, if you looked at the league table I put up, it's not something you really want to be on. Um, so I think that 
um, the more countries that move away from the death penalty, there will be an isolated rump of countries left. Um, and either they'll be, they won't care and they'll want to still be in that group, or they realize that um, the world has changed and the state sanctioned killing um, is simply not justifiable anymore. Um, I might just ask a question that I've got from uh, outside of the, the chat here, um, sort of related to what you were just saying about, um, you know, lo lots of countries are moving towards abolition. Um, and in the first video you showed us, it did seem like there was some mention in that from the people who were talking about the treatment that they had received, which was sounding like what we would consider, you know, uh, inhuman or degrading treatment, uh, possibly even torture. Um, in the countries where you're seeing these moves away from using the death penalty, is that something that the death penalty project as an organization might start looking into in the future? Like more of a sort of um, the work that you do in the death penalty sort of sphere, taking that into like inhuman degrading treatment torture, or are you still keeping very sort of focused on your, your key core abolition of death penalty? Yeah, 95% nine, of our work is, is death penalty focus, but um, we also deal with um, what happens after the death penalty. So how do you replace the death penalty? Um, so we're very concerned about conversations about replacing the death penalty with life without the possibility of parole, um, which um, some people would say is life without hope. And um, it's, um, it might seem like a quick sell um, to replace the death penalty um, with that type of sentence to appease um, the public. Um, but we don't feel that um, replacing one inhuman punishment with another potentially mm -hmm. human punishment is the answer. Um, so in a number of countries where former clients who are on death row have had their death sentences commuted to life imprisonment. Um, we are involved in litigation, looking at what life sentences mean in certain jurisdictions um, to ensure that release mechanisms, parole systems work properly where they do exist and where they don't exist to encourage um, the introduction of proper parole systems um, for people who have served very long time um, in prison. Great. Um, we have a couple of more questions now popping in. Um, Julia Freitag asks, or says, fantastic talk, thank you. Uh, quickly on China, although I do appreciate this isn't somewhere you formally, or a country who is conducive too much or any dialogue about this, but are we seeing a disproportionate attack on Uyghurs from the numbers of people we see on death row? Or is this data um, so guarded that we simply cannot tell? Um, you need I mean, to yeah, interestingly in China, I mean, there has been dialogue. So our organization has worked um, on um, different projects in China, um, working with different institutes, the Mac, Max Planck Institute, um, the National University of Ireland, um, the Centre for Criminology at Oxford. Um, we collaborated on a large scale project looking at the death penalty in China. Um, it wasn't uh, to bring um, legal challenges, um, but it was to discuss the potential for reform of the death penalty. And there have been some positive steps. I mean, it depends how you measure steps, but there have been steps in China to reduce the number of crimes. Um, this has happened. Um, so the number of crimes for which the death penalty is a potential sentence has been reduced in recent years. Um, an extra level of scrutiny applies to capital cases now. Um, all death sentence cases have to be reviewed by the Supreme People's Court. That is a, a relatively new intervention. And there's definitely been a shift in, um, I'd say, in public attitudes through the internet. Um, a number of notorious miscarriages of justice um, have caused public concern about the use of the death penalty. So whilst China is still a very large executor, there's no question about it. And again, we can't really put a number on it. Um, we've definitely seen a change. And there has been relatively open dialogue in recent years about reforms. Um, 
So abolition, I have no idea about when China would um, abolish the death penalty, but there have been conversations, at least with academics in China, um, looking at um, the need for change, the need for reform. Um, so we've got uh, a question in the Q&A and also a question in the chat, which I think we can kind of combine. So I might try and do that. Um, so in, in the Q&A, Stephanie Palmer asks, uh, I think that the link to colonialism is very interesting. Is colonialism, colonialism sorry, now used as an excuse or is there something more fundamental at play? And then the question which is in the chat, which I think relates to this point uh, from Jennifer Trigil, Trigel, sorry if I didn't say that right, it says, thank you for an excellent talk. What do you think the reason is for Commonwealth states being disproportionately slow to revoke the death penalty compared to the global average? And then there's an extra, as an aside, they're also disproportionately likely not to have adopted a right to a healthy environment. Do you think that it is general reticence to legal reform or something else? Um, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't level that at the judiciary. I think the judiciary, we've seen a lot of judicial activism throughout the Commonwealth, um, whether that's in India, through the Supreme Court of India, um, whether it's been Caribbean judges, some fantastic recent decisions from the Caribbean Court of Justice. Um, part of the problem is structure. It's the way the um, Commonwealth, Carib well, the Commonwealth, a lot of the Commonwealth constitutions preserve pre-existing laws. Um, they're all based on a similar model. Um, the death penalty is enshrined as an exception to the right to life. So it's very difficult to, um, to move away from the death penalty without constitutional amendment. Um, so there are some legal impediments to change. But I'd say that um, broadly, and it's, it's hard to speak about 50 odd countries in, in one breath, but I'd say broadly, there's been a lack of political leadership on the issue. Um, people, so for example, if you take a country that's gone decades without executing, but still has the death penalty on the statute books and may still sentence people to death, but then will routinely commute those death sentences. Um, the answer to, well, isn't it time to move away from the death penalty altogether? Um, the kind of answer we get is, well, what's the problem? Um, we're not executing, just leave it alone. So. There doesn't seem to be much um, impetus to get the death penalty or abolition of the death penalty on the political agenda. People don't see this as a vote winner. Um, and it's really a, a political game, ultimately, abolition of the death penalty. So um, there is a lot of reticence. Interestingly, the judiciary in Kenya um, a couple of years ago when they abolished the mandatory death penalty and more recently the Caribbean Court of Justice um, have talked about the death penalty as being strongly linked to a bad colonial past and wanting to create a fresh legal order um, for the people of the Caribbean or the people of Kenya unshackled from colonial laws and colonial punishments. So there is a conversation that is happening, um, but it's not necessarily happening through politicians. Um, I mean, in some countries, the colonial punishments have not only been kept, but they've been perpetuated. So Singapore and Malaysia are good examples where the colonial punishment, um, the death penalty was for murder. Um, and then Singapore extended that to drug offences as well, and then imposed a mandatory death penalty for drug offences that had nothing to do with the colonial order. That's been, um, these are developments by Singapore, independent Singapore and independent Malaysia. Um, so it is a difficult conversation. I think that when you take the Commonwealth as a whole and you try to attack it through Commonwealth bodies, I think the Commonwealth sort of lacks teeth on human rights issues, if I'm to be perfectly frank. Um, and it's very difficult to get um, human rights issues um, on the Commonwealth agenda. So when there are Commonwealth heads of government meetings, we tried for the whole time I've been doing this to get the death penalty on the political agenda and we simply can't do it. So there doesn't seem to be a Commonwealth appetite um, in spite of the fact that there's a Commonwealth Charter on Human Rights to address the death penalty. And maybe um, it's not something that can be pushed by the UK um, politically. Um, the UK is probably the wrong, the wrong country um, to try to lead on human rights issues within the Commonwealth given the history, um, but maybe there are other abolitionist countries within the Commonwealth 
be it Canada, South Africa, New Zealand, um, who maybe need to take the lead on these particular issues. Okay, great. I think we have time for probably one more question. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee who um, asks, how careful should we be when attempting to argue that lengthy periods on death row constitute inhuman or degrading treatment? By doing this, we are not are we not encouraging countries maintaining the death penalty to act more quickly following sentencing, enacting more executions and reducing the time available to mount an appeal? Good question. Um, the answer is you have to be very careful deploying the death row phenomenon argument. Um, in the US, um, we, we haven't pushed and friends of ours that litigate in the US um, are afraid of running the arguments in the US for exactly those reasons. In the Commonwealth Caribbean, um, in Zimbabwe, um, where they've also rejected the death row phenomenon and in India to a certain degree, where they've also rejected the death, the death row phenomenon, um, at least post conviction death row phenomenon or pending clemency. Um, there's no risk that they'll cut the appellate process. So the appeals still run. Um, there's no risk um, there. Um, I think that the what's interesting is if you look at the, um, the judgments carefully, so if you look at the Pratt and Morgan judgment carefully, um, it could really be a judgment abolishing the death penalty full stop, because it talks about the alternating hope and despair of being on death row. Um, for me, it's arbitrary to say that after five years that that bites and it becomes inhuman and degrading. Um, it may um, bite after one day of going through the psychological torture of being on death row. And going back to that Taiwan video, and we're currently involved in a, um, in a, a study looking at the profiling, socioeconomic profile of all 40 death row prisoners in Taiwan and also mental health screening. Um, there's a serious concern um, that all prisoners who end up being subjected to or sentenced to death suffer from what we call the death row syndrome. So that's not a medical term, but it's just, I think we'll all understand what we mean by that. Um, so the death row phenomenon is really one stage away from abolition. I think the arguments for abolition are the same as the arguments against keeping people on death row for long periods of time. But yes, it's you have to take a um, careful view as to how the judgment will be received. Um, there's no doubt in the Caribbean since 1992, it's um, had a dramatic impact on um, reducing executions. Um, so it's been a, a positive development, um, but it's also a recognition that the death penalty is ultimately cruel and inhuman. Thank you very much, Saul, for this, um, for your answers and your very thought provoking. Um, but also, I think for those who do pro bono work, hopeful talk, and um, we've seen the change, the rapid changes that happened. Thanks very much to your work and the work of the death penalty. Um, just for those, um, you know, you know, who have attended today, thank you very much. Please stay tuned The CPP has a number of, you know, interesting guests that we've invited for next term. So um, we'll send out invitations and the term card very soon. Thank you very much to everyone. And I think, yeah, thank you very much again um, to Saul Lear-Freund for taking the time um, to be with us tonight. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks for having me.